How you doing, Mike Bradley? I hope you're doing well as always. Boutique amplifiers. Let's have a chat about them. As um, this kind of came to mind to do a topic on this on, on YouTube because uh, a lovely gentleman, Martin, hello, mate. Uh, he left a, a message on my Facebook page and was basically saying, uh, I, I posted a picture of my Hampstead amp, my beautiful amp, which is right behind me. He was basically saying, didn't quite understand the justification uh, for the prices of boutique amplifiers. Um, and yes, they're, they're very expensive, you know. Um, and he was like, you know, he just couldn't understand the justification or see the justification in his eyes why, you know, they are priced as, as they are, you know, so high. And I think a lot of people think like that, don't they? I really want to open this video up in the comment section for people to have a chat and discuss how they view this kind of stuff. Um, because yeah, amplifiers and guitars, you know, are expensive. I was saying to him, you know, the sounds of these type of amps, you know, once you play them, um, and I was saying a few other things as well, but my, my views of these, you know, if I play, say, um, a solid state amplifier next to any given valve, there's gonna be a difference. But now, let's take it up. Playing a valve amp next to a valve amp, you might think, well, that's the exact same thing. Now, um, I, I don't have any, I'm endorsed by Hampstead Amps, but I'm gonna talk about many different uh, amplifier brands here. Now, I've had a few over the years. Um, now, uh, my first valve amp was my Marshall JCM 2000. And I remember getting, and how much was that? I think that was about, I think that was about 1100 pounds, I think. And I remember getting that and I was like, oh, that's the, that's, the, that's the rock and roll tone. Because I didn't really understand the difference when I was 17 years old, what a tube or valve amp was or a solid state. I thought an amp was an amp. You know, I didn't understand that valve amps have that tone we all love. So I had that for years. And then I had always wanted a Cornford amp, insert picture. I recently did a video talking about my old Cornford. And uh, playing that next to the Marshall was night and day. The tone was phenomenal. And more importantly, it, it made me play better because that was the sound I could hear in my head and just the way the amp responded to me and to my playing, uh, dynamic wise, tonally wise, all sorts of things, was, you know, taken up by God knows how many notches. Now, the Marshall JCM2000 and the Corford MK50 are both valve heads. So you think, well, why is there a difference? And I guess, you know, the Comfort is classed as a boutique amp. Um, you know, so the way I look at it, certain amps, you know, which are that no, Marshall amps, whatever, you know, many, many different amps that have to put a brand name on them. But they're kind of mass produced and there's load of people work on them, blah, blah. Boutique amps, there's one, two, three, sometimes just one guy or lady working on that amp and put in probably about, I don't know, 25, 35 hours in it. Now that's one man. So, all woman. Hashtag me too. <laughs> so, sorry, I don't <laughs> But yes, yeah, so that's one person working on that amp as opposed to 25, 30 people, you know. Um, or whatever it is, you know, what the big corporations do. So that's a lot of hours for one person to have to do there.
Now, 35 hours on a job, and if you total that up in, you know, salary terms, you know, now we're seeing, and then on top of that, the attention to detail there, because that's one person working on that. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like tunnel vision, and chances are the person like that has a passion for it. They're putting their love in it and whatnot. So, to me, that's where... I don't know if I'm really helping matters here by saying it, but you know, the Cornford next to that Marshall, like I say, the 17 year old Mike, and Amsterdam, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, but then when you start playing these type of amplifiers, you know, so like I say, Cornford, uh, Hampstead, Two Rock, Dr. Z, you know, when you start playing these, the, the response they give you as a player is phenomenal. Um, you can really feel it, but a lot of times um, they're not very forgiving. And what I mean by that, they highlight your mistakes because they're not compressed or anything. Um, of course, it depends if you're, if you're putting a boss metal zone through it, you're going to compress the signal. Um, but, you know, I, I, that to me is where the money goes into it. Now, if you can't afford those amps, you know, then unfortunately that's just life. Because if you think of it, like, you know, a Ford Mondeo and, you know, an Aston Martin DB9. They're both cars, they both do the same thing. But the attention to detail in the Aston is night and day to the Ford Mondeo. You know, and you, with Rolex watches or anything, a pair of night trainers, you know. Now, why is she saying that? Night trainers, we know, cost about a pound to make, and then they sell them for about 150 quid, you know, 150 pound, whatever. That's maybe not the case there. But I think the car term there is very, is very true. You know, they both do the same thing. A Ford Mondeo, which I can't even get anymore. Aston Martin DB9, they both are cars you can drive on the road, etc. But the feel, and I've driven an Aston Martin DB9, very nice. The feel of driving an Aston Martin is, it, you know, it's so smooth, it's comfortable. You don't hear the, you know, the, the horrible noise of an engine. It's just such a, it's a beautiful machine to operate and to drive in. The Aston, uh, sorry, the Ford Mondeo still isn't, you know, it's an all right car. It's, no, it works, you know, but you're going to get just that extra je ne sais quoi to the Aston Martin. Same thing with amplifiers. And I, on a personal level as well, I, if I'm playing for a really good amp, it doesn't have to be boutique, but if I'm playing for a good amplifier with a good guitar, of course, I'm gonna play better. If I'm, and it's also kind of mind games as well, I think maybe, you know. Um, you know, if I've got a bad sound, now I could have a bad sound for an expensive amplifier as well, should say, but when I plug into the Hampstead, when I plug, I plugged into a two rock overdrive, like I don't have to sit and fiddle with a good amp like this. Um, you know, my Fender Supersonic, which you can just see on camera. I love that amp, great little amp. Uh, I think just under a thousand pounds I paid for that. Cool amp, I still gig with it now. But when I'm gigging with it, sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. You know, I've got to kind of sit, dial it in, and I'm always like, oh, I wish I had my Hampstead with me. You know? When I gig with the Hampstead, I don't think like that at all. I plug in, I adjust the volume to whatever I need it to be. I'm happy, you know? And you know, I don't, it's just one less thing I need to worry about and I can concentrate on whatever I need to play, whatever gig or session, whatever I'm doing. I'm not always happy with my Fender Supersonic. It's a cool amp. Not always happy with it though. With this I am, you know. Um, and like I say, I've gigged with a two rock overdrive special. I remember it's like, oh yeah, 
<laughs> like it just the response and oh there's a you know what if you go for my instagram videos i think it was probably about a coming up to a year ago maybe and i've got my gibson 345 i've got this girl plugged into this two rock overdrive and i just turned it up to full and i just did a little i don't know 30 second video on um on instagram and um it was just singing it was amazing absolutely amazing now i don't know how much a two rock overdrive is i think they're over two grand um you know so back to the question of where's the justification of it costing so much money you know where's the justification of anything costing too much money where's the justification of you know a supercar being a hundred thousand pounds you know or bugatti being what are they like a million pounds or something like that you know but it is you know the little the little things will all add up to make a great thing i think um like i say a lot of times with these amps and guitars as well you know you've got a lot of luthiers now who are working on their own and they're you know a one-man team just crafting these guitars on their own so that attention to detail that is one person so again, in a factory, if an amp is, right, most person's doing the PCB, the printed circuit board for that, and this guy's doing the Tolex over here, this, that, 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 that. You know, you've got a lot of hands going on there. It's being passed about or over the place. You know, if it's one guy, or maybe two, no, two or three people, just working on that, probably all in the same room. You know, someone's got in charge of soldering and the next person, you know, it's all, the amps are staying there. Um, that those little fine details help create that amp and a lot of times these people have really good ears um, and they kind of know how to tune an amp where if you just got someone being on the payroll and they just got they're being told to solder this that that and that and so they just do it and that's it you know where I imagine a lot of times with a boutique amp little things they're testing it right let's try and change this let's test you see what i mean so i'm just rambling on here probably <laughs> and that's why i said i would like to open this up and um see what other people think um i personally i can see the justification of the prices of these amps some of them are a little bit silly now a dumbbell amplifier let me just put this back Now, a Dumble Amplifier is probably the highest booty camp out there. Um, and I believe Alexander Dumble came up with the idea, well, well, when I say came up with the idea, was inspired by Robin Ford's guitar tone. I think Robin Ford was playing a Fender basement and that tone spoke to Alexander Dumble and then he went on to make the Overdrive special. Is it? I'm not really a Dumble expert. But um, I think they, like in the early 80s, which is 1981, 82, something like that, I think he was selling for $3,000, which was a hell of a lot of money back in 1982. I can imagine rates that would probably be the equivalent of about, I don't know, probably 15 grand today. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not the best mathematician here. But, you know, certainly more than what three grand is today. Now I think a Dumble goes, you know, for a price of a bloody house, you know, like over a hundred thousand pounds. That is ludicrous. That is nuts. <laughs> okay, now I can't see the justification of that. I could say that about the Clon 
Klon overdrive pedals, you know, or boost pedals. I can't see the justification of a pedal being a thousand pound. I think that is ludicrous. I will say that right now, right? But, you know, with the Dumble, you know, what I hear about Dumble amps, anything like that, it's all kind of uh, created for the player in mind, so, you know. I think Robin Ford and Larry Carton were both on tour and they plugged into each other's amps and they weren't feeling it because the amp wasn't tailored to them. Um, and, and, and there is there, an amp being tailored to you. So that's the next step up from a boutique when you're getting something designed just for you. So that's where the prices and stuff come into. But like I say, when you start, when you start getting to 10, 15, 20,000 plus for an amplifier, that I think I can't see the justification in. That is ridiculous. Even to be honest with you, over five grand, that's when it starts getting nuts. Um, and there are amps out there, you know, I could say that about guitars. When you start seeing a guitar for about five or six grand, you think, what? What are you talking about? What is <laughs> this? Like... probably haven't answered anything and I've probably but I've just tried putting something across and what I think about you know boutique amplifiers but there is a certain all I can say is from playing a few and hearing a few players you know over the years playing them there is a big difference when you have a standard uh, mass-produced amplifier next to you know a one two-man team boutique amplifier. I was playing a festival on um, yesterday, actually, Sunday, and uh, I took my Amstead, and whenever I take my Amstead to a gig or a studio, I always get, what was that? What Amstead? I haven't heard of that. That sounds amazing, which is lovely. And I get to spread the Amstead flag, everything like that. And then there was a guy on later on, and he and I, I was out the back, and um, I was like, oh my God, that, tone, that guitar tone is amazing. No, and I could hear he was playing a Strat, then it sounded like humbuckers, and then I eventually walked to the front and he was playing a 335. I was like, his tone is great, and he had a Dr. Z amp. Now, would my ear be as caught up if he had an Orange or a Marshall? Who knows? Because at the end of the day, it's still the player. It's still the hands, isn't it? Back to the Robin Ford thing, I've heard people say, and, and it's true if you watch YouTube videos, you hear him play his Dumble, and then you hear him play like for a friend, the twin. That still sounds like Robin Ford. But I 100% guarantee he will know the difference and it will make him play different. And, you know, that's where you, you know, the pennies come into it really. You know, if it makes you play better by having a more expensive amp, cool, you know. If you st if your tone, what you hear in your head, is a PV Bandit, cool. You know what I mean? All the power to you. Um, but there is something very special about these boutique amplifiers. They're just 
channeled in a certain way, you know, they're just, everything's just tightened. The Aston Martin DB9 comparison again, you know, all these little fine details all, you know, go up to the pot and make, you know, a great difference, all these little things. And unfortunately, that's where the pennies come in, like I say. So I really, really, really would love to know your thoughts. Um, this would be interesting to watch back and see how much I am rambling here. Um, but uh, but it's interesting, isn't it? And like I say, I'm glad Martin brought up this um, question to me because, like I say, a lot of people, I think, uh, are probably thinking the exact same thing, you know? Or there's people out there, you know, thinking kind of how I think, it's like we're talking about, it's obvious, you know? Uh, so yeah, fire away in the comment section guys, let me know your thoughts. Uh, if you haven't done so already, check out um, the, uh, the video I did on my Comfort MK50, if that was fun getting that back out, I'll put a link and a card, I'll put a link in the description box, the card probably popping up now. Um, but yeah, boutique campifiers. Check If you haven't checked one out, go to your local guitar dealer and try one out. You know, try Hampstead, try Two Rock, try Dr. Z if they're there, Morgan Amps. Um, actually, I played, I did play, um, I played a Morgan Josh Smith amp and, uh, the other day, and it was alright. It didn't, it didn't hit me. But a lot of times you need to turn those things up as well. So, there you go, I've just thrown a right old, uh, <laughs> curve in the tail there, haven't I? Uh, saying that so yeah let me know your thoughts but just because of, I should say just because something is a booty camp doesn't mean you're automatically gonna like it you know it might not be tailored for you as a player you know if you're if you're a metal player playing something which is quite unforgiving and isn't compressed isn't for you and that's where like a Mesa Boogie comes in or something like that that you know which kind of delivers that type of um, compression but if you're a blues guy, um, where dynamics and uh, you know different tonal frequencies are very, very important as a guitar player, you know something like a Hampstead or Two Rock or a Doctor Z is gonna speak to you as a player, and then a Mesa Boogie probably wouldn't. So there we go. Anyway, I rambled a lot. I hope you're very, very well, and uh, I'll get back to some playing very, very soon. <laughs> Oh, before I go, thank you so much to everyone who has liked and subscribed to my YouTube channels, who uh, follow, who have supported me on Patreon. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. Um, if you haven't already, check out my website, mikebradleymusic.com. You can get some lessons and music from me and whatnot. And if you're in London, August the 30th, I am doing a, uh, a show, a session with Yamaha. It's a free event. Uh, link will be in the description box below it's free to come but you do need to get a ticket and quite a few tickets have been snapped up so there's limited you know you can have so many and quite a few are coming which is amazing I look forward to meeting you all but uh, yeah if you're about August the 30th Thursday August the 30th it kicks off at 6 o'clock in Soho down Wardle Street at the big Yamaha um, flagship store Myself and my band will be there rocking out with this very guitar. Anyway, now I will sign out. Hope you're very well. I'll speak to you very soon. My Bradley signing out. The devil's on my side. Talking to myself again, I'm bored of what I say.